Okay, so uh, welcome uh, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, following our stream today. Uh, my name is Dervish. I am from Java Bin, the Norwegian Jug. Uh, this is our eighth uh, meetup uh, in our online series. Uh, and today we have uh, Madek uh, with us, who is our guest speaker. Uh, we are running weekly meetups on, uh, towards the summer. Uh, and we are very happy to have you with us uh, today. Uh, as always, if you have uh, questions to, to, to Marek, please use the comment field in YouTube and we will make sure to bring the questions to, to Marek and we will get them answered in the end. So uh, if there's any other questions about our community, about Jalbin, please just uh, ask us, follow us on Twitter uh and uh, Malek, welcome and thanks for uh, participating uh, with us and uh, uh, in these special times so i will just leave the rest for you and uh, to everyone have a nice evening and, and we will see you in the end thank you Darvis, and welcome everybody thank you very much for the invitation for this online event well hope uh, luckily for us we can make something good out of this lockdown and the crazy situation in the world, which is pretty, uh, pretty awesome. So thank you very much. And my name is Marek, as Terry already mentioned. Uh, I live in Poland. And I've been doing all oh, programming for a very, very long time. <laughs> uh, uh, mostly this has been web development. But um, uh, recently, I did also some deep learning uh, development. And this is something I would like to share with you. So hopefully your way after this presentation will be much easier and you will have points of uh, starting points for some of the uh, things you would like to start within either machine learning or, the, or deep learning. And hopefully deep learning for j will be your initial choice just to make you know the uh, learning curve a bit, um, a bit easier, a bit lower. Um, okay, so let's start uh, presentation. Today, I was trying to. Uh, oh, this is my page, Twitter page. My nick is Bendy007. Well, maybe it wasn't the best choice of a nickname, but you know, the account is available and I'm not going to change it right now. So, how are we going to talk today? Uh, what are we going, what I would like to present you? So first I would like to tell you how my whole journey with deep learning and deep learning for j started. Uh, the, you know, the background of the project, uh, uh, why did we decided to choose deep learning for j Then there is a small introduction because uh, some of you might be thinking that it's already too late for uh, deep learning or machine learning to get involved. So I think it's contrary if we're right in the time to get started. Then uh, there is a small comparison, uh, the section of uh, Deep Learning for J and general machine learning, Python tooling, how Deep Learning for J fits into this picture. And then we're going to move as the last section. We're going to move into the Deep Learning workhorse or computer vision workhorse. This is the CNN networks. And I would like to present, finish this session with some uh, section with some sort of demos so we can see how the deep learning for the examples work and how to do integration and use reuse the models that are provided by the framework creators. Okay, so let's get started. Um, the first thing is, hmm, I was hoping for my clicker to work. Just a minute, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. Um, all right, so just to give you a background. So this all started as a live streaming project. The client wanted to do a very sophisticated live streaming um, software from scratch. Uh, so we decided to write it in Java. They even had, had their own custom Linux distribution, uh, which was a success because even without prior knowledge into video or um, streaming, uh, we were able to produce a very good and capable, uh, very reliant solution in a relatively short time. By 
having this, and you know, there's great cooperation, our client decided that we should move into AI. And because some of the if, uh, live streaming feeds were sports, he wanted to do um, um, as one of the goals to do automatic sports recognition from the video. And this brought us into deep learning uh, subject. So as you can see, this did not start as a research project. This started as a, a uh, linear development. So we had something, we had great cooperation and then client wanted to use the latest technology to improve the user experience on his end. And as you can see, we started with no prior experience. <laughs> so that's why uh, I decided to uh, do this presentation because uh, at, unfortunately, at, so, so this meant reading a lot of papers and trying out different things. So I even made a deal that when I was commuting and reading the papers, I already got paid because I was learning knowledge relevant to our project and how to um, use this de deep learning or other um, networks to enhance our solution and you know, move the project forward. So, but unfortunately during also this uh, AI phase where we had no idea where to start, we did some circles or we did some dead, we hit some, some dead ends. And I think that some of this can be easily tackled with this kind of presentation where somebody will tell you, uh, points that should be verified and identified and then how to move forward. So we have a lot of knowledge to cover because initially what you're going to see today was free Java meetups here in Wrocław. So it was an introduction CNN and some parts of the code are a workshop that during which the um, attendees will get a chance to build a working solution of digital recognition. So let's start because we have a lot of ground to cover. I'm sorry, but I don't know why, but my arrows are disabled when I start talking. Sorry, so this might happen occasionally. So just to give you an idea of the, this video streaming project, there was a crash of our first component. And then I wanted to see how much time the machine was up. It was up for 28 days and it was receiving the stream continuously. So I said, after 28 days, this is a great result. So this is not really a, and the bug was by something we did not know. And after fixing it, the client did not, never come back. So this was a huge success. And then we thought, and you know, my idea of deep learning and those neural networks before we started this project was that I'm too late because there's plenty of information that AI is already present in our lives. So starting with these two products, the Huawei Kirin product, and then, you know, Oral-B, this is the company that produces something for your teeth. They also advertise their products with artificial intelligence. And as a Kirin is a Huawei chip for, it's called neural processing unit. It's everywhere. And I'm a big, big Tesla fan. And, you know, starting with 2013, Elon Musk said they need three years, then the two years. And every once in a while, he says, we're almost there to autonomous driving. And I said, well, if Tesla is almost there, probably it's too late already. Well, not really, because the, 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 the way when Tesla started, they thought that computer vision and those CNNs and the way neural networks uh, perceive the world is 80% complete. And this is the <laughs> image of uh, road markings in London, where you can see that, you know, there is a more artistic approach to those markings. And this is part of the reasons why Tesla is still failing in some situations and they still need to adjust and uh, gather their data in order to be really fully autonomous. Then you might also have heard, oh man, I don't know where it stops. Um, you might also have heard about this ImageNet. Um, since 2011, the ImageNet is, was a great data set, open source, created by Fei Fei Li, that was used to train CNNs and there were competitions. So you can see that there are results from 2011, 2012, up to 2016, which was the uh, top five error classification. Top five means that in the first five results of your network, neural network, there is one proper answer. And here you can see human error, which is around 5%. So you can see that the error has dropped significantly below the human error, 
which is really good. But the metric here is, I don't know if it's really useful for production because you make five turns and then your car tells you, well, I don't know which turn should I take, you know? So this is nearly, this is, this is, this is really uh, something we would like to have and treat it as something useful. On the contrary, there was a Polish Italian team that did all those networks, the, the standard networks. You can see here, I think inception was 2000, maybe 16, 18, and they measured with, with top one accuracy. And you can see that they got 80%. And sort of by accident, this graph is sort of narrowed down. So you can see what happens if you add human error. See the gap here we're still way ahead, way behind. I mean, there's still plenty of um, uh, things to be done. So keep calm, you're not too late. I think we're in the best place to, best time to really start uh, using machine learning or deep learning because it's going to be not just the, some fancy uh, startups that do AI, but this is going to be part of the standard toolkit of every developer. I can give you like this video project, by, but then after the video project finished, I got involved in a project for recognizing skin cancer. So this was the, the also work for the uh, computer vision. And even though we weren't as a team directly involved in the research rela related to creating the network, there were some engineering tasks that need to be done. So for example, there was a memory leak and the researcher didn't really know what was going on. So they were using a GPUs with, which are pretty expensive on AWS. After fixing the memory leak, their costs dropped by, oh, a large amount. So we programmers, developers will need to have a knowledge. Like you're in the Java world, you need to know Linux because most of the deployments are on Linux. And at some point, you will be forced to use the Linux or any other uh, operating uh, system uh, that uh, that your Java runs on. And then this is so, sort of like this DevOps culture, right? You need to know something about your deployment, even though this is your not your daily activity. So we're exactly in the right place. And then the artificial intelligence as a whole is a very broad subject. So you can see we have neural language, natural language processing, I'm sorry. Uh, then we have machine learning, we have reinforcement learning, we have deep learning, which is actually the computer vision that we're going to talk about, but it's very broad. Even if you're using an Android phone and you have Google One, so this is something that gathers data. So artificial intelligence is also sometimes referred to as algorithms that based on, uh, that operate on data. So how it's different from, uh, from the regular, I don't know why my slides are not moving, sorry. Uh, th how this is different from the regular uh, computation. See, we here we have how the regular computation works. We have input, we have program, and we have results. And for machine learning, we have input with the desired output. And during the process of the training of the neural network, we have the output. So it's actually the two phase um, process. And then this, <laughs> this is uh, one of the reasons people use Java, right? You can't have runtime errors if your code doesn't compile. So if you're not, uh, if you haven't noticed, this is a joke, of course, but a lot of people would like to have the same tooling. They know the compiler saved them a lot of time and they know it helps a lot. So um, well, using Java might be also another uh, point, but also, and this was our case because we were doing this um, video processing that was very computation intensive. And uh, sometimes people tell me that, hey, Marek, but you know, we're in the, pro, uh, in the times of microservices. So why not, you know, put all the um, deep learning related stuff to microservice and then uh, fetch the data. Well, this wasn't actually, uh, this wasn't possible because of the uh, uh, time requirements that were put on us due to this video processing. You know, if you, if we have to wait during the, for the network answer, at least one second, we have already 30 frames on a video that have passed. And then this was something we were uh, pretty, uh, this was pretty important. On our end, 
we were actually integrating with Net.io, but you can integrate with Spring Boot, with Spark Java, with Java E, with AWS Lambda, with everything that works in the Java ecosystem. And as you can, we will see that it starts pretty, pretty normal, the integration. Uh, I'm sorry, I have to do something on those slides. So uh, I told you that there is a standard way of looking at this it would be to go into Python solution, but then you need to uh, learn new tooling. So why not try with something that has all the options like deep learning for, for J has linear algebra, it has layer API, it's optimized for CUDA, it has parallel computing, and it has a model zoo. So something that I would like to show you during the uh, demo that there is an option for sharing or using pre-trained models. Also, from the architecture perspective, there is a very good choice that the Deep Learning Project creators did. It's called the backends. See here, the way your neural networks is running is abstracted. So you just need to define proper dependency in your um, Maven or Gradle, and then you can use either GPUs or CPUs, or even Deep Learning for J can uh, decide what to use. Inside it, there is a, an ND4J, which is scientific computing for Java, and then it also integrates with some uh, parallel computing, which I checked if uh, Keras or Python have this sort of integrations, and they don't. So this is something that Java world is a bit better mature um, um, parallelization support that is then you're capable of running very cheap um, pro processor instance on AWS. So let's let's look at a simple example. I don't know if you ever heard of uh, Andre Karpati and his CS231 and course. So at some point I wanted to see how hard would it be to move some simple example of a network, neural network into Deep Learning 4J, actually not ND4J. This is the um, linearly non-separable data set and the image depicts the, the linear separation that was trying to be, it's called the naive approach. And then in order to prepare the data, we have the script. So it contains um, two um, areas or two planes of data, then using some, um, trigonometric functions, we're making sure that they are linearly not separable, and then we have we can visualize them. So in order to start a Java project, see, I told you, we start we started in a very, very regular way. So we define a dependency in our dependency management system. The choice is yours, but um, I stick to Maven for its simplicity. Uh, at least for now, it's been uh, pretty, uh, good for, for the project I used to take part in, but you, you can also use Gradle, so it's not, um, you're not locked only to using main. And then see uh, how this translates into, uh, into Java. Uh, you can see that I put the original Python comments into uh, Python code into comments. So we can see that this is actually um, the same, uh, this is actually doing the same thing. So you can see we have also de declaring the, uh, the data set, then we're uh, applying some uh, operations to make it linearly not separable. And you can see that it was a success. You can see the data set is, pre is prepared and then using uh, ND4J, so the Java code for uh, pre preparing this data set. I stopped at this point because this was enough for me. I wanted to see if ND4J is capable of doing it and if I can do it in a um, timely manner. So well, if, if you were supposed to look at this slide and then I usually ask my audience where to start, what is the most common thing that you can see that is repeated, repeating, re repeated on, on, this, on this slide. So I intentionally did not use Java 11 syntax. So you can see those int arrays here, 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 here. And this is actually the trace, the, the uh, participants usually see that in order to start a, a, a working with deep learning for J, you have to know int array and the operations. This is true. And int array is actually a tensor. 
um, for if you have more than three dimensions. It has some properties. It has rank, uh, which is number of dimensions. It has shape and it has length. Um, length is a product. I don't know if uh, you're, uh, um, how is the Norwegian uh, synonyms for the math, but in Polish, we don't use product for the multiplication results. So this is something I already um, started talking about that in order to be really familiar with the deep learning, you should at least know the math, that the math operations that are involved, like product, like dot product, like um, square root, or um, the derivative. Oh, I used to say also the deviation, the standard deviation, which is also used in the um, other areas of uh, English for something different. So make sure that your math synonyms you can translate into uh, English math synonyms because this is very important in order to be able to read those papers. If you're going to do deep learning and provide your own solution, you have to do reading of the research papers. So this is really important. But going back to int ri, you, we have rank, shape, and length, and we can start creating those uh, those int ris using some uh, Java syntax. I'm sorry, guys. I don't know if I speak too too, too long, <laughs> the, the, my slides freeze. I'm, I'm apologize for this. This happens for me for the first time. So, so see, this is pretty simple, right? We create an in our example three by four, right? Three by four, and what is different here that in order to create uh, the uh, actually it's it's four by three because. Uh, in order to create uh, the, the int array, we take first the number of rows and then the number of columns. So you can see this is correct because we have three rows and four columns. But this is something also that you need to be uh, aware of and remember if you're creating uh, those arrays by yourself. So let's say, let's take an image. So an image has three dimensions, width, height, and the color depth. Uh, for color depth, we have actually an RGB here. And then let's see how we can read it. This slide, maybe this is not the most optimal way for reading an image into memory. There's also an open CV port uh, that does it more efficiently, but I keep it here just to show you that once you start with your uh, ecosystem or your language or your libraries that you know, you can already start your uh, journey. And this is very important if you're going to do the visualizations of your output, something that I was really impressed at how much an easy visualization can help to understand what happens within your network. If you um, notice my previous post about this uh, row uh, RI, you will notice that this um, this is actually an error. When presenting, when preparing this preparation presentation, I made an error and I kept it here because the um, number of uh, the, the the dimensions are mixed. This is the the correct one to do this is actually a bit different. Um, oh, I'm sorry, we have so little time and I'm stuck with the slides. <laughs> so this is actually the correct one because the, the depth uh, here is as the first one. And then we're putting the pixels one by one, creating the array that is already can be understood by the uh, neural network. And then we, if you want to change the order of your shapes, then uh, you can use the method permute permute i. Then there are different operations like create, zeros, ones, mean space, add and mule. And they all follow, follow or they can take advantage of the um, Java features like overloads. So each one of them, instead of um, arithmetic operators, we have to use the methods mul, and then for multi multiplication and everything that uh, finishes with an I uh, is uh, in place and everything that is not I means that you have to return the result, even though the deep learning for j uh, underneath might create a view for you in order to preserve memory. I'm sorry, I'm looking here down, but I have a phone of hour here, just to you know, make sure we're uh, good in time. Then if you create your RI, you can also reshape it. This is pretty useful if you want to store an image as a flat RI and then reuse it. This is something that is used for the dig digit recognition. If you would like to follow uh, the operations, those low level operations of MD4J, you can go into NumPy cheat sheet. This is something that is part of the Deep Learning4J um, 
examples, and then you can view if the all operations are there. So for my uh, initial preparation of this uh, linear non-separable data set, I used this page in order to make sure that my operations, uh, I, I know them and they are there. Okay, so then there is also the higher level API. API. This is only the starter because we're going to uh, look into details what actually happens in CNNs when we move into CNNs. But uh, this is just to give you an, a hint of how the layer network is being constructed. So we have an, an API of layers We're using builder pattern. This was chose by, chosen by, a, by the deep learning project creators in order to make, give you a flexibility and make the experience much easier and not being forced to create a lot of objects up front. This is actually working as you can see here because the whole network fits into my slide. <laughs> It's not really complex network, but still it fits. So we can see here we have an uh, activation. So this is something that activates your neuron. We also define some uh, parameters for the layer. This is actually a convolution layer. And then we have subsampling layer. And then we have dense layer, which is a fully connected layer uh, for your output. And something that the deep learning project creators did, they they mixed two things because they mm, mixed layers with activations, which is pretty cool. And then we have an extra output layer, which contains a classifier. And then an input is a property. So if we compare it into the same network uh, that was created using uh, Keras, come on slides, I'm sorry guys, I have to wait for them. So this, if, if we compare them, you can see that here we define a convolution layer with some parameters like kernel size, number of inputs, then stripe, and then activation. And on the lower part of this slide, we can see that we have model that is created with the same parameters and the same size. So the number of filters, uh, but the, the way we define in input is a bit different because it's a special method. So this is actually something we can already use for building our own networks. This is very simple and it does not force us to use this low level ND4J API, but uh, in order, uh, if you're, um, um, if at some point you're stuck, you're going to use it. And in order to feed the network, you also will have to use uh, the InfoJ RI, so we like reading the images, reading your data set that you're going to provide to the neural network. So uh, in order to finish this uh, first round, may, just don't be shy and don't think that it's too late and everything's been solved because it's not. So definitely it's a good time to start machine because it's becoming part of the mainstream and like knowing the Linux or the other parts of your ecosystem, uh, or I don't know, debugging tools, or probably if you're doing web development, you also need to know JavaScript. So machine learning, deep learning is becoming mainstream and definitely you will have a chance to apply those skills. So deep learning hub 4 j has everything that is needed. It, it has a good optimization. It has a layered API, it has a low level API. Um, it can run on GPUs. And then high level APIs can be um, uh, used. Uh, so the knowledge can be then transferred. If you plan to start with Java and then move into let's say Keras or Python, then this is also a good choice because um, eventually after getting through some materials, you, you'll see that the biggest part of, the, of this journey is going to be deep learning. Okay, so this is part one, and now we're going to move into part two. Let me see if I have somewhere, I think I have somewhere the, the code. Let's see if I can find it uh, for running this small data set. Oh, there it is. Hopefully it will be possible to, to show it to you. So this is the code that I use for generating. Is this, no, 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 sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry appearance, uh, enter, presentation mode, okay. Um, okay, 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 okay. 
So this is the code I showed you on my slide. This is for creating this non-linear non <clears throat> non-separable data set. So this is first creating the two dimensions. One is for data, the other is for labels, and then returning as an int array. You can see that I'm um, iterating here through rows and then applying some trigonometric functions in order to have it uh, produced. And then there is a visualization using some plotting library. So this one, I for this one, I use Java 11 syntax. <laughs> uh, okay, after, I think I have to exit the presentation mode in order to start it. I'm sorry for the switch. Okay, this is not the one, this is the one. All right, so let's run it and see that this actually, it actually works. Well, right now, nothing happens. I think I have to, you are sharing the screen. Okay, this is good. Let's, I don't know on which screen this will, this will pop up. Um, so I have to check all of them. Oh, there it is, there it is. See, this is the, the, the output of this program and it's, um, it's actually the same data set uh, for that was used for this, for this uh, initial um, Python course that I showed you. So don't be shy. And then at some point you will see that it's all the same. It's all about deep learning and the framework are irrelevant, but it's easier to start with deep learning for J. Okay, so now let's go to, let's go back to slides <clears throat> and start with, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. To the origin of convolution neural networks, which is the CNN. Um, so uh, the CNNs are now the, the work, uh, the workhorse of the uh, computer vision. And the solution we used to develop had uh, two areas that were, we were doing a research. One was the um, LSTM networks, so an network network with memory. And then the other one was the CNN. Eventually, uh, the CNN was the good choice, was a better choice it won because it has um, easier training, lower computation complexity, and it had really a very good, perf a very good um, uh, not error rate or the uh, success rate so that it was giving us proper results. So that's why let's start with CNN. Oh my God, those slides freeze. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> Okay, so it, when we talk about neural networks, we think about the brain. So this is the slide I'm starting with, just to give you an idea of the brain, because we think of a human brain, right? And then <laughs> I always have this question, okay, so where is the front? So if you can um, just, you know, right now we don't have this easy interaction, but if you can think for yourself, if you can point to the front, don't worry, I, I, I wasn't sure in the beginning when I started presenting where, where it is. But if you chose it right, you show to the right hand side of the screen. This is our chin, no, forehead, forehead, sorry. And then our visual cortex is in the, in the back of our head, something that actually is responsible for processing images. But then if you go into those um, research papers, you might find out that this wasn't actually a human brain <laughs> that they used for the initial research. It was a mammal brain, right? So I give an example of five mammal brains and then think uh, for a moment, which one would you choose as a input for creating the neural networks? Was it red? Well, human, not really. So we have four. Was it red? Was it cat? Was it chimpanzee? Was it dolphin? Well, going by, you know, comparison, delphin probably and chimpanzee is almost as complex as human. So maybe not the thing. Red, well, red might be a bit too small. And if you chose cat, you win a prize. <laughs> this was the cat that inspired the researchers into um, trying to mimic its behavior, its brain behavior, into creating the first neural network to watch the CNN. And if you see this slide, you will understand why this happened because it was a cat vision that influenced it because initially you can see that there's electrode 
So this is an invasive method or in, invasive, I think, a method of uh, verifying brain activity. And as I think it was somewhere in the, I don't know the, year, the years, but right now we have this uh, uh, RMI resonance, magnetic resonance that can scan your brain without opening the school. This wasn't the case. So they were trying to prove that this line was actually received by the visual cortex, which is probably this, as this image suggests, they're also at the back part of the uh, CAT screen. And they managed to do it. And this was how the, the uh, brain or the brain activity influenced how the, uh, how the CNN was created. But then if we think about shape detection, the naive way or the simplest way to do it would be to create parts of an image and then create an array of it and the numbers are, you know, represent the, the um, part of the image and then zeros represent empty space. You looking at those images, you can understand why there is so often in the research, the black and white pictures, because they are easier to track as they flow through the net neural network. And then you start with the shape detection by having this small field, which is called actually a receptive field. And then the pixel values, you start computing your dot product, right? So this is something where we start with the math. We compute the dot product. We uh, multiply those two matrices. And then if we get something above zero, shape is found. If we get something zero, sorry, no shape is found because uh, the, uh, the, the two uh, matrices don't have a common point and they are, uh, and only zeros produce zeros. So <clears throat> this is pretty simple, but then what happens if we have multiple shapes, right? So right now we're going to the area of machine learning. So the classical way of thinking about it, I know you might be, you, you might say that there is now algorithmic ways to uh, to do shape detection. Don't worry, we'll go to we'll go to this. But what I want to say is that uh, to point you is that this feature extraction has to be done manually. So it's also called and it has to be engineered. So somebody has to understand the data set and the way it is searched through and the patterns and then prepare an algorithm or a, a whole solution that is capable of consuming new shapes and then um, reacting on, on them. But th there are some issues. Then I already mentioned that uh, the color images might not be the case here. Then how would we add new shape? Probably this would also mean that somebody has to spend some time on preparing the map of the new image. And what about execution time, right? When, whenever we have new images, probably our execution time is going to increase. So this is where we introduce the convolution. It comes from the digital signal processing. You can see that the blue line contains original signal and the red line is something that is already pre-processed. So this, this is uh, called filtering and this is also convolution. It comes from signal processing. And then if you start looking at some theory, how to combine convolution in the area of neural networks, you might find this visualization. Unfortunately for me as a newbie, maybe you guys understand it right away. Probably it was just me. So it didn't actually mean too much. So I had to look around and then how this image, you know, with two waveforms uh, relate to image processing. This was a bit distant for me. So I started looking around because convolution is meant to be a filter. So uh, filter, like you see, you, you did see on this uh, digital signal process processing, the filtering means that it's, uh, the, the noise is removed and then we can analyze the, the output in some easier manner. So we don't need the peaks. But if you could think of the graphic filter, there are two areas. So usually people who use Photoshop can think of a graphic filter and people who uh, finished computer science and were into computer vision also can think of a filter. So one filter is of course the uh, Gaussian blur or blur, blur filter. And the other one is something that is also uh, pretty uh, commonly mentioned during the presentation 
is the sorry guys i'm switching the slide um is the sobel edge detection so this is something that I, uh, you might be thinking, okay, we, we don't do this in this simple manner. We have algorithms for that. And you're right, because this is something, we have two um, kernels that uh, are, are able to identify edges. And then we have three by three kernel, we have image gradient, we have first derivative. This is where the math starts, <laughs> not too much but this is where the map starts. And then it changes, uh, it, it can detect the color in change, uh, in, in change in color intensity, sorry. And then you can see that whenever the color changes, the derivative reaches its local. This is very important, local minimum. And then we can uh, tell that the edge has been detected. Then we have a tool for, um, coping with color images, but then still two things are left. How do we add new shape and what about execution time? And this is the comparison of the machine learning and deep learning. Machine learning, the, in machine learning tra tra traditional, uh, which will used to, used to be pat called pattern recognition, the feature need to be engineered. And in deep learning, through the hidden state, because then the deep learning means that we have some state that is not accessible directly, it's accessible only indirectly by the result. Um, the neural network is doing the feature extraction for us and then uh, it can generalize onto unseen pictures. And then we have a convolution layer that does all of this. See, um, we have a, in deep learning for J, we have an, I, as a um, end of this uh, in introduction, I told you that there is a convolution layer because it gives you a kernel size uh, you can say how many, uh, how, what is the depth of your input? You can say how much should it move? And then how many features, how many layers would you like to have? And then you can have multiple filters. So it's done automatically. This is the magic of the, of the um, neural or deep neural networks that they can verify different areas automatically. That's why they're so computationally intensive. But let's move forward. Ah, damn it. <laughs> Sorry for those frozen slides. <laughs> um, oh, maybe I'll drink water. And usually this feature extraction has this pyramid shape. So we start with something big. Uh, this is the number recognition. And then the number of, um, I think it's features decreases, but we have more of them until we're able to compare them or present them in the output using the fully connected network. And then what is the output? This is the question usually. What happens in the network? Okay, so I know there's a filter. So what is the output? See, the output is shape because this is something that was matched by the filter and then it's passed further down to another layer for further, I'm sorry, processing. And see, these are the visualizations of different filters. I'm very sorry, excuse me. And then maybe this first one is not really meaningful, right? Probably this is from the digital recognition, but these ones already resemble parts of the face. You can see there's an eye here, there's a nose here, there are some lips here, and also a full face. So you can see that actually the image was transformed by the network, and then we can do facial recognition. There is one thing that is implicit in the convolution um, output is the number of outputs. There is a special formula. So if ever you are forced, because normally if you do layered network, you don't need to do any processing of your um, output between layers. But if you want to do it by hand, you need to know what is the output. So if we do it again, go back to the simple example, we have five by five uh, kernel, we have one, uh, depth of one and then we have stride one by one we want to have 20 uh, feature feature 20 uh, out, the size of the output by 20 so we would like to see what will be the size of the single element that is outputted by the layer it's 24 by 24 using this formula i hope i got it right <laughs> so then what happens during the convolution there are two great visualizations that i use for presenting it so we have a uh, so we have a filter that moves, that moves through 
through the through your image, and then uh, the dot product is applied, and then the output is then transformed here. There is also a bias that might be used for moving. If you don't, if you're not getting good results, you might use move a bias, use a bias in order to move a little bit through the plane uh, when you're looking for the solution. See the convolution here. This is also by Andrew Carpati. Uh, this is how uh, it's presented. So we have a filter here, and then we have an image here, and the output is produced here. So we there are multiple ones. So we have different um, depth of the filters that are being verified. And then this is just a forward pass, right? So this was pretty simple, right? We take an image, we move by a certain number of filters using this. Uh, kernel or receptive field, and then we have an image and then we pass it down. But what's happened next? What needs to happen next in order for your network to probably to properly identify an image? This is have to be in backward pass. Uh, it's also called back propagation. This is something that changed the whole world of the deep learning. And this is where the magic starts. Because in order to um, uh, apply the uh, classification need to have a loss function. These are actually two of the most common ones. We have a mean squared error and we have a log logarithmic likelihood that are commonly used as the loss function. There has to be uh, one thing. They have to be, um, they need to have the first derivative in their whole domain or uh, so, so that it's possible to do that propagation. And then, this is the measure of inconsistency. So you can see that the, the um, area we might be trying to, we might be navigating, might be a very mm, complicated. So we have local minimas and maximas, but what we're trying to do is find how far we are from our uh, uh, label. So our how far our predictions are from the expected output. So this is done by the, Oh, 45 minutes. In deep learning for J, the thing I mentioned by using this output layer, uh, and then here we can define uh, our loss function. How many classes for digits? We have 10. And then what is the activation function? There is a gotcha here because uh, some loss function work with some activations, but it's not one-to-one -one mapping. So before applying it, uh, please verify that you're actually using a proper combination. And then how does the training look like? What actually happens inside of this CNN? Because we, we, we're looking for this optimization problem. So we have a global minimum that we'd like to find. But if we stuck here, then our network would not, will probably not generalize. So this is a gradient-based optimization method. We're going, we're, go, we're going through this local minimums until we find a global minimum and this is the holy grail of the training. Using the gradient descent, we move little by little, little by little down the slope. And until we can see we're moving up the slope, we're staying, this is our minimum. So that's why you might see somewhere that people are trying to do different um, steps for these uh, passes, because if we move to, too fast, then you're going to be, uh, you're, you're going to overlook some of the minimas. If you're going too fast, you might be stuck in the minimas. So there might be some tweaking involved. And there are some known uh, algorithms for gradient descent. This is the list. There's the stochastic momentum, Nesterov, Adagrad, Adam, Ada Delta, and Adam. And they are all represented in the deep learning for J. So you don't need to do it by yourself. You just take, you know, your blocks, your um, uh, legal, <laughs> and then build your solution out of it. And then there is something about first derivative uh, that needs to be at least communicated where they're talking about back propagation. This is a uh, first derivative, but as you can see in the picture, the back propagation is uh, computing the derivative in the memory efficient manner, but you can see this is the output. The uh, whole, uh, tr I think it's called tru truth or in ma mat mat proof, mathematical proof or the, the equations for it take uh, at least I think one screen. So if you want to do it, you can, 
but if you just want to start and see how you know how you feel about it and what's your feeling maybe it's not the right time to go into the details how this is computed if you know that their derivative exists for the given loss function it's good to use it and start using it just like that and then after you gain some experience and you see this is something you want to really investigate maybe this is the time to learn the more uh, or deep the dive deeper into this mathematics and then back propagation actually is split into two steps because for one step this would be um, very uh, too uh, complex because when we know how far we're from our expected result we need to do the parameter update so after uh, reading uh, after getting those uh, uh, computing the distance from our expected output we need to propagate the the error from our output layer into this fractional errors in our network so this is by adjusting um, parameters and then again deep learning for j has a, a different algorithms for updating for parameter updates so it's all there and you can start with it when the new one comes out usually there is a recommended one for training neural networks the one that works best or, or converges the best or gives you a best generalization so but if you're just starting probably it doesn't that it shouldn't matter that much so if you see the different pieces of uh, uh, in the examples of the uh, deep learning project don't be shy these are the different steps of the training of your neural network uh, damn it sorry for freezing those slides okay and then in cnn so we know that the parameters are being updated so this is the general uh, formula or general representation of the neural network we have input we have weights we have bias we have output and what is the weight in the convolution layer what actually will be updated during the process of the training so if you think about it so when we do the forward pass what is choosing the right part of the image to be processed by the next layer and then how do we narrow down the features set in order to have then classification these are actually the filters and see that's why I include this image and that's why I encourage people to think about deep learning not in the terms of the hidden state in here in the middle those two layers but in terms of feature extraction that in traditional machine learning you have to do it by hand and in deep learning this is done by the network itself and it has some advantages so we we can now do color images we can add new shapes because we even can do um, processing of unseen shapes by the network and then execution time you see deep learning performance increases as the amount of data also increases so this is the uh, summary of this uh, cnn introduction convolution is about filters networks learns filters during training so then you can um, have uh, the image process and it learns part, part of the image and then um, it's very efficient. Filters are applied during the image uh, to make predictions. Training is about optimization. So we're trying to optimize the error to make it um, get rid of it. And then back propagation is propagating error, partial errors. Remember every part of the network is responsible for generating some of the error and then the way for the algorithm is to make sure that all of them are applied and then gradient descent is used to optimize weights on the or, or the filters oh man <laughs> uh, we have still some time so i think we, we will be able to uh, make some demos um, just, just use the time uh, marek we still have some time yeah just uh, just continue okay Thank yeah. you. So, um, so the first thing I would like to show you from the deep learning for the examples, because when I started this um, journey, I was a bit of a overwhelmed. What happens here? Because you can see there's plenty of it, and 
really, this is really a good job because if you want to see if your um, network, it will be running on CUDA, you can just use this one. But the best one is here for me because it has plenty of different uh, uh, research papers that were translated into neural networks. And then even for some of them, not here probably, but if you look for the examples, you can find even a link to the original research paper that was used in order to produce it. And now you can see, this is something we already know. We have a main, we have some static me method for calling the UI server. This is something to generate statistic. We have some iterator here for the data set. We have some sort of input parameters. And then this is the thing, how to build the network. See, we have this updater. We have those layers, convolution. Everything I told you about is here. Then we have subsampling. And then we have a classification and an input. Um, maybe some of, these, uh, some of these methods are already deprecated, but they work and let's do the training. So see here, so the, the first thing that I was really happy that this is Java because I was able to do, uh, I was able to do, uh, change the paths because for some reason this model wasn't written into the place where I wanted to be. So I decided to change it and then I could do it just like that. And then you can see here, this is also my tweak uh, because initially this used to contain system print lines and I wanted to have a logger. So I uh, introduced a logger here that is using a log4j, I think log4j too, but I'm not sure. Okay, so let's start this training and see if it works. This is actually really funny because this Lenet example contains 60,000 uh, let me <laughs> I'm out of steam. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, we've done a lot of material during this uh, 50 minutes. Believe me. Um, and then um, where I was going with it. Okay. Copying resources. Oh, no. This might take a while. Okay. Let's see if it works. If it takes too much copying resources, I'll just, I'll just stop it. But it's okay anyways um because i think my resources have some extra resources so let's see if we can disable them um, what i wanted to tell you is that this is now pretty funny because the project structure and then resources because right now we can run it on our own machines and recently I spoke to my friend and he said when he was training this network, uh, it really took forever for him. <laughs> so right now we can have this one. Okay, let's see. Let's see if this helps. I hope it, uh, it does. And then we can see the training process. Um, but hopefully you, you, you will be able to see that this takes, this takes very short time in order to, to be built. And, oh, see, parsing Java, I think it's good. And uh, when this uh, network was initially released, it took forever to train it. So now, even though you might not get super accuracy with those 60,000 images, but it's possible to, you know, go through the process of training and then getting the first model. The thing I forgot, forgot to tell you is that Deep Learning for j is also capable of uh, storing your model. So this is something that happens here. So if you train your network, then you can store your model and reuse it. So you don't need to have this two pieces one by one and training. And I know, but it might sound weird right now when I say it, but <laughs> oh, there's an error for with this version of deep learning for J for um, for uh, Mac OS. No, nevertheless, if uh, there is a fix in the newer version, I'm sure, because I used uh, I use it as well. So if you start it, this takes around, I think, 20 seconds. So we'll be able to see it. And then uh, the model produced, you will be able to integrate it. So let's, um, I have some integrations also produced, prepared. So if we go here, see, this is the first integration. See, this is the model we used to write. So 
uh, it's it's a different project as you can see it's much simpler it doesn't have this uh so here is our oh this is the old one so this is the the place to store the models so we have also the java files we have logger we have maven configuration everything that is used in order to use you uh, start a normal java project uh, just like that so and then let's see because this the idea behind this project is to have a very simple i don't know if you know this uh, spark java framework which is uh, i think it's um, based the it, it, on sinatra framework from ruby and it's influenced uh, it's 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 supposed to be super easy rest api uh, specification so let's go into presentation mode and then we can see so this is this is the first thing i i did here was to restore the previously trained network then you can see we're starting with we, we start serving uh, static files and the api here is supposed to uh, receive an image uh, an image that is um, drawn on canvas then we do some see this is the thing we do normal processing of the image in java then uh, it's converted using this very simple or some people say naive method into something that uh, is understood by the network and then and then see this is the connection we have digit representation f that is understood by the network and then we get the output if output is over 30 percent so the um, probability of the uh, probable result is above 30 percent i will display it so see this is very simple we don't need to do anything special in order to start it and i would like to show you also two more projects i told you that deep learning for j uh, also supports a thing called um, no knowledge transfer i think it's called knowledge transfer i'm sorry now uh, let's see the uh, the other the other screens with my i don't know why this is switched sorry sorry i'm trying to go into another demo where i have a pre-trained model this is the zoom model also uh, uh, that is provided by the deep learning project creators and this is a very uh, good uh, place to start building your own solution or if you know how to extend this pre-trained model start with this one because then see ImageNet, ImageNet contains millions of images so it's just a general classifier of i did as you can see <laughs> cat dog and then it still uh, operates under some captcha but you can see here i have a native image loader so i don't do it by hand already uh, there is a uh, some pre-processor that is already prepared by the uh, by the deep learning project creators and then we're going to check the output and if the output matches the label the label is displayed see again this is here everything that is happened inside java world something that you can create on your own and try it on your own machines the uh, non regular cpus this will take around i don't know a second or two so unfortunately, this wasn't a good choice for video processing because it took a bit too long. But you know, if you want to start playing with it, just go for it. This is a very simple way. And also using some of the uh, deep learning for J, uh, I think I have to now uh, this, uh, exit this presentation mode. Uh, there is this, you know, I recently thought why there is so many sites not using these digits just the regular digits for captcha and then i found this example of <laughs> deep learning for j uh, examples of uh, actually solving the captcha even with uh, images i'll show you the the data set that is used for training this network um, in examples section um, let me just find the proper window and then here is the captcha let's find it here in the resources there should be images train images 
there's a lot of them that's why it takes a while to open but see this is what you something you would expect from the capture right you have uh, scrambled uh, digits then you have some background and then you have different colors so this network is already <laughs> capable of breaking this very simple demo um so you can see th this is already our ecosystem something we know and we use on a daily basis something that is easy to start and something that is really just lowering the barrier, the entry for us, for Java developers to start, uh, even if you're not interested in uh, doing the data scientist role, you will be, in my opinion, you, you will have to understand at least the basics and know how these things works, work. And this is the great place to start. I really recommend this is something that Gives you see I'm using IntelliJ I'm using all the uh, Java libraries or this is actually I think AWT for this image transformation. The last thing I wanted to show you <clears throat> because there are some demos online also and there's a great visualization of this Lenet. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Oh, here. Let's see, we can draw a number here, and it will show us. This is pretty amazing. I was so happy when I first found it. And you can see what was happening in the network uh, uh, when it's, I think it, it's, it's somewhere between seven and eight. This is Lenet on 60,000 images. There is an extended data set of 600,000 images, but you know, it still, it still does a pretty good job of um, being able to introduce you into the neural network uh, world of deep of deep learning so i really recommend even <clears throat> for uh, as the as the beginning and you can see here what was happening how the features were extracted and then what features were used in order to produce the final result as you can see there is a lot <laughs> so this is the issue with those deep neural networks that usually we are not able to understand uh what is happening inside. That's something I told you in the beginning. If you're able to do a manipulation or some sort of visualizations on your own, it's much, much, it's going to be much, much easier for you. Probably not like this one because this one is pretty sophisticated, but even, you know, finding out which neurons were used or what was the value in the neuron or what was the path within your network or what was the layer uh, value this is really helpful. Unfortunately, I think this is WebGL. Maybe that's why my uh, laptop stops playing my slides because they are also in the in the browser. <laughs> okay, so I think that um, now we can do the real summary of the both parts. Let's see if I can maybe have something here to help me with it. If not, sorry, this is not the thing. No. I don't think I have it. So, um, okay. So, uh, thank you guys for watching. Um, I think now is the question part. I'm Marek. And see, so the, the goal of this presentation was to give you starting points, to show you that you are in the right place to start. Maybe I start, stop sharing. And, oh. So you are in the right place to start your deep learning journey. You have a tool, which is Deep Learning 4J library that you can start using. You can use IntelliJ, you can use Java libraries ecosystem, you can use Maven, everything that is available. The API, as you could see, has low level and higher level elements that are useful. And then there's plenty of examples to start with, even with the data set. So you don't need to do your own data sets. I hope you've enjoyed it. <laughs> this has been a pretty uh, extended journey. Um, I hope we, you've enjoyed it. And now I think we can move to questions part. Thank you so much, uh, Marek. Uh, so I have a few questions uh, for you. So uh, let's start with the first one. Uh, will the slides be available? Yes, I can publish them. <laughs> no worries. Super. Uh, second is, is the code, uh, code samples uh, available? Yes, they are. 
Well, actually, if you guys are interested, I also have a small workshop uh, for deep learning practitioners. <laughs> if you'd like to start using deep learning or get to know the examples or you know need some help with getting started, there is a one day workshop. So go to your local leaders and ask them for this workshop. Maybe we can figure, we can figure out something. Thank you. Uh, next question is, uh, what is your thoughts about the availability of tools and models for Java and deep learning for J compared to Python? Well, this is a very good question because uh, every scientist uses Python. So everything, new things are uh, created in Python and in the ecosystem. So, and this is something we had also trouble with because there is a new uh, type of layer called convolution LSTM for which would suit perfectly into our project. Unfortunately, it's not, it wasn't available in deep learning for J. So we had to figure out something different, but at a starter and mid level, don't, don't worry about those sophisticated tools or any other things, because you still need to go through the deep learning through the, through the process of checking your, uh, ver getting your knowledge and then if you go through this process, you will have, um, it will be, you, you will not see the difference because still you will, during the process of the learning, probably some examples will be in Python, but this will lower the burden of, you know, going through the steps of uh, installation and learning the new ecosystem. Yes. Thank you. This was a very, a very good question. That's why I did the comparison of uh, Keras with deep learning for J, just to show you that, you know, the features match. Mm. Very good question. Uh, a last question is, have you used deep learning for J in production? And if so, what is your experiences? Actually, our project finished before we were able to launch. Unfortunately, our time window closed. So I don't have any experiences. We were that close from putting into AWS. <laughs> The other project I told you about, about uh, the skin cancer recognition was done, unfortunately, in uh, Python. So mm -hmm. I, I never managed, unfortunately, to put deep learning project into production. But it's still uh, quite interesting to see uh, deep learning and creating uh, computer vision applications with, uh, with, with Java and, uh, and a Java library. And uh, is that uh, uh, is that something that you would uh, recommend? And is that uh, can it work? What is yes, your definitely. This is something the, the biggest surprise for me because our client, the CTO of the startup, he pushed us very far into using GPUs, and I said, well, maybe. And finally, he bought us uh, two 1080s from NVIDIA that we plugged into our Macs. And oh my God, it improved a lot. <laughs> this was really a blast. So, and Deep Learning 4J was also capable of utilizing those into 100%. So this was something that really gave us some speed. And this was based on our also, because we had little time, because we were also, we had a lot of things, other things to do to, uh, and, the, and the startup wanted to do fast time to market. And we were five Java developers. So we had to go through the deep learning. And then if we wanted to start Python, all of us would have to learn Python and it pitfalls because I'm a great JavaScript fan. I used to work as a JavaScript developer and I know that the switch from a compiled environment that guarantees you some things, not all of them, right? Those sometimes errors in my slide, but it frees you from some things. And then if you move into dynamic environment, well, it changes a lot. So if you're short on time, definitely try to do it with deep learning. And there's another step because deep learning is, uh, I would say the last step in a journey. If you start your um, machine learning AI solution, usually, I think, at least from this experience we had, start with something simple, build your experience with your data set, uh, then try finding a regular algorithm to have something in production. And if this starts failing, move to deep learning, but be prepared you know, to enhance your solution and to go to for different steps and take some, you know, um, cir uh, not circles, but you know, some, some changes. Be prepared to do some changes. This is actually, I was surprised because I thought about it as a way to 
introduced the project, the deep learning project. And then I was a speaker at the conference here in Poland, in Warsaw. And there was a data scientist who said that she was presenting their uh, deep learning solution. And she said it was their third approach because they had something that was working with the if statements. So, so they knew the data set, they knew what they wanted to achieve. They knew the feature set they wanted to extract, but it wasn't performance enough. So they moved then with the data set, with the data set, with the knowledge of the features, they moved into deep learning solution. Very cool to, uh, to hear about. Marek, thank you so much for uh, contributing uh, to Jalabin online. Uh, it has been great to listen to you, to your experiences with the, with the deep learning for Jay. And uh, thank you everyone uh, who participated. Uh, uh, let's see if there's any more questions. Uh, I have a few more questions for you, uh, Marek. Let's take those as well. Uh, will this video be available afterwards? Uh, yes, it will. It's on the same URL. It will be available. Uh, next one. Uh, uh, there is some uh, thank yous uh, for you. Last question. Thank you, guys. Thank you for participating. You. Uh, one is, what do you think uh, is the future of the, uh, deep learning for J in comparison to Python in software industry? Uh, it's, it's hard to say because deep learning for J is built around the same concept as um, other Python libraries. So it has a backend that is optimized for those heavy computations. But uh, I think that the enterprise is going to like, because there are always the questions, if I start with deep learning for J, will there be a job for me? Maybe should I learn Python, right? But there are some banks who already invested in their Java infrastructure and they look for people who specifically know Java libraries for deep learning. So definitely there will be a place for it and the company who runs the deep learning for j now it's called pathmind last year they got a grant for something like 30 million dollars for uh, extending the solution and maintaining the project so i think it will be extended and soon we will see the release of the official version and with that i say uh, thank you and uh... Uh, good luck with the uh, with the uh, with the future work on uh, deep learning, Marek, and thanks again for uh, for being with us and uh, contributing to this uh, series online. And with that, uh, I will uh, end uh, this stream, and we will be back next week with uh, some guest speaker from uh, JFrog. Uh, please uh, join us again next week. And uh, with that. I say uh, thanks, everyone. And Thank you, guys. Thanks night. for participating and thanks for inviting me. Bye-bye. Goodbye.